Hello, my name is Tiffany Patton Burnside, licensed clinical social worker, and I serve as the Senior Director of Crisis Services for the Chicago Department of Public Health. I am excited to present the Crisis Assistance Response and Engagement or CARE program. The CARE program is Chicago's first alternate response program. In my role, I supervise the clinicians on the team and I oversee some of the day-to-day -day operations of the program. Here in Chicago, we're currently piloting a few alternate response models while we are developing the infrastructure for a larger scale rollout. Over 60,000 people are hospitalized for behavior health reasons in Chicago every year. This is nearly twice the amount of individuals hospitalized for heart disease. In Chicago, the highest rates of hospitalizations happen on our south and west sides. Some of these communities are also high hardship communities. As you all know, in the past, there are only two locations for individuals in behavioral health crisis. And for most individuals in crisis, neither of these locations are appropriate. One of the goals of the care team is to decrease behavior health related ED visits for those individuals who could be better served in the community at alternate destinations. CARE is a partnership between multiple city and state agencies overseen by the mayor's office. Each agency has its own internal structures and policies, and these policies were pulled together to create the infrastructure of the program. As mentioned before, the mayor's office provides oversight. Office of Emergency Management and Communication dispatches calls to the teams and develops call scripts related to call taking and dispatch. The Chicago Fire Department staffs the paramedics on all models. Illinois EMS Region 11 provides medical oversight, among other things, and the Chicago Police Department staffs the multidisciplinary response team with CIT trained officers, while the Chicago Department of Public Health staffs the mental health clinicians, among other things. Honorable mention goes to University of Chicago Health Lab for conducting program analysis. Chicago is comprised of 77 distinct community areas. What you see before you is a heat map of 911 call volume showing the areas with the highest behavior health related calls. It is data like this that help the city decide within which community areas the program would be piloted. Our teams are currently operating in 13 community areas. The CARE program has three different response types to ensure more than one response option fits a variety of 911 calls with behavioral health components. First, we have the pre-response. This calls for a clinician to be at the 911 call center responding to mental health service calls that can be handled over the phone. While this part of the program is still in development, ideally, the clinician will be handling low acuity calls, and assisting call takers with screening behavior health related calls. Then there's the response. This is where the magic happens. This is the part of the protocol where the team is out in the community responding to the calls that are dispatched from the 911 call center. I'll go into more detail about this phase on the next slide. Then there is the post response where residents are linked to appropriate community based services to address their underlying needs. The care team conducts follow-ups for 30 days after the initial crisis. During those 30 days, case management is occurring to ensure the warm handoff to community-based agencies is secured, and the team offers support to the individual and sometimes families to decrease the likelihood of another 911 call. When the care team arrives to a scene, they first debrief with any other first responders present. Once the scene has been deemed safe, the team engages the individual to find out their presenting problem. The team utilizes verbal de-escalation and mediation when necessary. The paramedic on the team conducts a physical health screening to ensure the individual is not suffering from any medical issues that might impede a mental health assessment or could be a mitigating factor to the current crisis. The clinician conducts a mini biopsychosocial assessment to determine the client's mental status and level of acuity. A needs assessment is also conducted. As mental health crises do not happen in a vacuum, the needs assessment is done to determine if there are any other mitigating factors contributing to the current crisis. 
The care team does not only work with individuals in crisis, they also work with the families to ensure everyone is on the same page as it relates to treatment, safety plans, and post-intervention care. Once all assessments are completed, the team, including the individual and their family, produce an immediate plan to resolve the current crisis. This plan could include transporting to an alternate destination or hospital if necessary, drafting a safety plan, and giving referrals to known community agencies. To meet immediate needs, each care van is stocked with weather appropriate clothes, water, food gift cards, hygiene items, bus cards, and harm reduction supplies. These items are also used as engagement tools for those clients who are a little more difficult to engage. The CARE program has three different types of teams doing this very important work. The alternate response team consists of a paramedic and a clinician. They respond to lower acuity calls, those calls that screen as having no threat of violence or weapons present. The multidisciplinary response team, this team has a CIT trained docs officer in addition to the paramedic and the clinician. These officers have received additional and enhanced training for working with individuals with severe mental illness and substance use disorder. The MDRT can respond to higher acuity calls. And then our newest team is the opioid response team. This team follows up with individuals post opioid overdose. They get their referrals from the Chicago Fire Department data and consist of a paramedic and a peer recovery specialist. Care teams are staffed from four different roles, each with specific expertise dealing with behavioral health crisis. Everyone is certified or licensed in their respective fields. All members of the team, except the peer recovery coaches, are all city employees. Recruitment occurs following the city processes. All agency leads work diligently to retain its staff by ensuring fair and equitable wages and safe working conditions in an environment that honors the whole person. For a call to be eligible for a care response, the individual should be between the ages of 12 and 65 years old. There is no threat of violence or weapons and no co-occurring medical crisis. If the 911 call screens unknown for weapons and or violence, the MDRT team is eligible to respond. There are a couple of different mechanisms by which the care team gets their referrals. The first being the primary dispatch. This is where calls come through and are screened by the 911 call center, then dispatched to the team. The second being police assist. This is where the police are dispatched and once they get on scene, they determine the call is more suitable for a care response and they go over the air to call for the care team to come and assist them with the call, of course, after ensuring the scene is safe. Then there is the non-emergent follow-up. This is where the team is conducting in-person follow-ups with clients. These follow-ups could include assisting clients with getting prescriptions refilled, transporting to intake appointments of the referrals that were given, or ongoing engagement of clients who are in that pre-contemplation phase or may be more difficult to engage. Lastly, the care team conducts proactive outreach to known areas and priority populations to offer support. An example of this happened about two weeks ago when the Department of Public Health was notified of a spike in opioid overdoses in the city. When the team was not responding to calls, they were sent to the areas noted and handed out Narcan and fentanyl test strips in addition to offering referrals for medication assisted recovery sites. One lesson we've learned in the pilot is the great need for post-crisis referral options. Due to the overwhelmed mental health resources in the city, the teams are spending a great deal of time doing case management and holding on to cases for longer than 30 days. The team's dedication to keeping their clients out of crisis is unparalleled. The care team could not do this work without our community partners. Let's hear from Matt, who manages one of our Austin and Destination locations, as he explains the partnership between the living room and care. Hello, my name is Matt Jasper. I work as the team.
The CARE program went live in September of 2021 with two multidisciplinary response teams. At our inception, we had two teams operating on the south and west side seen in dark blue. In order to prepare for rollout, the teams received three weeks of didactic training and completed area familiarization by meeting community partners and sourcing resources for the individuals we would eventually encounter. While this was going on, leadership participated in town hall meetings with the residents of those communities, attended police and fire department roll call meetings, and met with other city agencies that might utilize the resource. In June of 2022, we launched our first alternate response team on the Southwest side, also noted in dark blue. Prior to going live, we followed the same training and area familiarization processes as we had in the past. In January of 2023, we partnered with the Community Outreach Improvement Project, or COIP, to launch the opioid response team on the west side, noted in light blue. COIP is responsible for staffing the peer recovery coaches on the alternate response team. A few months later, we expanded again into the downtown area with another alternate response team. We're currently planning to expand again in late summer, early fall of this year with two more teams noted in gold. The visionaries of CARE not only plan to build out the response teams, but they understood the assignment would be incomplete without creating alternate destinations. So coming in the winter, we'll be launching our, the city's first crisis stabilization center and sobering center. I would be remiss if I did I did not mention the amount of training that went into ensuring our 911 call center was ready for each arm of these expansions. What you see before you is a screen grab of our public facing dashboard. It shows how many care calls we have been on as well as how many follow ups we've encountered. Additionally, it shows that we've had zero uses of force and zero arrests since we started in September of 2021. As we started back in the fall of 2021 with one type of team responding to one call type. Since then, we added two other types of teams and we're now responding to five call types. A lot of work has gone into building the infrastructure to support this program. We have been expanding and tweaking the program based on data and lessons learned to ensure that when the program comes out of the pilot phase and expands citywide, the foundation of care is solid and the infrastructure needed to support the program's longevity is firmly in place. Our dashboard also gives a report out on the outcomes of the care calls. Of the 814 calls for service, 28% ended in treatment given, 12% ended in a transfer to another first responder agency for transport to a hospital. This happens when individuals have a higher acuity level that reaching presenting danger to self or others. 13% ended in the team transporting to an alternate destination. And for 30% of the calls, there was no contact. This typically happens when a third party calls about an individual they are seeing having a mental health crisis and the individual is gone before the team gets on scene. When this happens, the team does, however, canvas the area to try to find the individual. Additionally, we've seen an increase in this percentage in our downtown team due to their limited ability to get through the traffic of downtown Chicago. None of our teams respond using lights or sirens. And while we have 20 minutes to respond to a call, we typically get on scene within about 16 minutes from the time of dispatch. 9% of the individuals we encounter refuse services, while another 8% of our calls are resolved by another first responder unit. The beautiful thing about the CARE program and programs like it is that we are not under any time constraints to resolve these calls. I've been to calls that took two hours to resolve, while others only took 30 minutes. As you can see, we average about an hour on scene. University of Chicago Health Lab has been the evaluator for the CARE program since its inception. They came up with some key early learnings, and I'll share a few of those with you now, and I hope that they are useful to those programs that are starting out. First, call center capacity and infrastructure is key to successful dispatching. Our city was not accustomed to having responses beyond the standard police, fire, and EMS. 
adding a behavior health response require training of the staff around the new call taking and dispatching protocols, call script edits, and training on mental health just disorders in general. Additionally, we had the same care clinicians that respond to calls spend time in dispatch to develop a rapport with their dispatchers and build a level of trust in these new processes. For every expansion or lesson learned, we built on existing training to ensure everyone is operating with the same information. Second, as we all know, turnover can be high in this line of work with people being promoted or moving around within their respective agencies. Because of this, care leadership attends roll call meetings in care catchment areas on a quarterly basis to ensure everyone is aware of the program's existence and their role in program operations. Since we went live, we've seen a change in command staff and leadership. We even have a new mayor. It is because of these personnel changes, ongoing training about the program is mandatory. Third, having six agencies work together on one project can be challenging. In order to ensure the progress of this program, a project manager was added to the leadership team. Data collection is key. Every agency has its own rules for data sharing and honors HIPAA and the Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities and Confidentiality Act. Given these things, data sharing agreements were created between all entities, including U of C Health Lab. Operationally, we have one data sharing meeting per week, two quarterly meetings per month, and ongoing monitoring by agency leads. Fifth, build a strong referral resource network. In addition to having overwhelmed mental health services, housing is an issue in Chicago. The teams work diligently to ensure community partners have capacity for new referrals, while leadership works with other agencies to secure housing for the unhoused population post behavioral health crisis. Lastly, Regular meetings with other municipalities around this work is very important. It is in those meetings you will get to learn from each other, develop communities of practice, and collaborate solving problems. Those meetings will decrease your feelings of being siloed, and it is in that space that you will find community. I would like to thank the organizers of the Law and Mental Health Conference for inviting the City of Chicago to present on the CARE program. The work we have done over the course of the last two years has been nothing short of amazing. Since the pandemic, the need for mental health services has greatly increased, and I am proud to say the CARE program is here to address some of those needs. I'm looking forward to our growth and learning as we know there's still so much work to be done in this area. This has been Tiffany Patton Burnside with the Chicago Department of Public Health. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your conference. My name is Tiana and I've been with the Chicago Fire Department for eight years now and a community paramedic since 2020. For the past two years, I've had the privilege of working with the City of Chicago's alternate response care team, which responds to both mental health and opioid related crises. My training has allowed me to understand conflict better and to see and hear the concerns of individuals involved from a different light. I recognize that mental health, physical health, and substance use are all interconnected. And when I respond to a 911 call, I start the process of caring for the whole person right there on scene. And then I continue that process by connecting individuals with the resources that they require. Health is invaluable and mental health is health and I'm proud to work with a team that truly understands this and works innovatively to see that individuals receive the care that they need to achieve um, the optimum wellness and health possible. Thank you.